Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar delivered by our Faculty of English Education and Sport. This webinar has been delivered to you as part of our aspiring Bedfordshire project, working alongside all Bedfordshire schools and colleges to support and aid progression into higher education. It's also been delivered in partnership with our Premium Progression Partnership Scheme, a scheme that aims to work alongside schools and colleges across our region, again, to support students' progress and access to higher education. Tonight's webinar is being delivered by Mark Bowler, Perry Knight and Thea Meninsky. I'm from our Faculty of English Education and Sport. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to them for this evening's session. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. And can I say a very warm welcome this afternoon to the School of Teacher Education and to the School of Education and English. A, a very central part of our role um, is not only to train our teachers, but also offer wider experiences in terms of education in English, really thinking about what degrees and, and can, can, can actually offer. I'm delighted to be part of, of this series, as I'm sure my colleagues, both Mark and Theo are, um, and we look forward to working with you this evening. Oh, thank you very much, Perry. Uh, I'm Theo Maniski. Uh, I'm a principal lecturer in English language and linguistics. And before we get going, I'd just like to introduce uh, my colleague, Mark. Uh, Mark, would you like to just say hello? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Bowler. I'm a principal lecturer in teacher education. So uh, the Theo uh, is a portfolio leader in education and English, myself in teacher education. Perry uh, oversees both schools as, uh, as head of school. Thank you. So our topic for this, uh, this evening, it's uh, study, education and university in, in the 21st century. And I guess the first thing to say is that this is never intended to be a lecture. Uh, this is much more uh, a discussion. Uh, we'll be looking at some of the factors that are uh, concerning us in higher education today and the role that university plays in society and perhaps more importantly in an individual's future. So we'll be looking at our circumstances and as the talk goes on there will be lots of opportunities for you to give us some feedback in the chat if you can um, one of the things that uh, mark will be doing is he'll be monitoring the chat and i hope that he'll be able to uh, give some responses so the kind of things that you may want to think about and to respond to are things like what were you expecting to get from this this talk today and another question that we'll be examining is what will the next 10, 20, 30 years look like, certainly from a perspective of technology. We know that technology is moving on really quickly. And in the next 10 years, can we imagine what it's going to be like? Well, that's a theme that I'm going to talk about in a little more detail shortly. A couple of other points then is about strengths. If you think about yourself as an individual, wherever you are in life, and you think about yourself, where, what are you good at? What gives you pleasure? What makes you happy? Now, one of the questions I suppose that comes from this is why should we even be thinking about looking at inside ourselves? And the last point uh, for us to get going is this famous um, observation by Heraclitus, one of my personal heroes, uh, one of the philosophers, he predates Socrates, and he's quite famous sometimes for calling, being called the weeping philosopher. Anyway, one of the observations he made is that your character is your fate, or sometimes your character is your destiny. It depends on the translation. But I'd like you to think about that and consider whether you believe that that's true or not. Well, that's, that's a, a way to kind of like a, a starter. Let's think about university. There are a lot of assumptions about university, and some of those are fueled by the media, and some of those are fueled by what we hear from friends and family. So the idea of a, a very traditional uh, institution, perhaps you have a lecturer with a white beard. There's nothing quite so bad about having a white beard. Um, tutorials lots of assignments and of course debt 
money because nothing is free in life. We know that. But these are some of the assumptions. And one of the assumptions might be that when you go to university, you're left on your own. It's not like school. It's not like college. You have to just get on with it and sort yourself out. Well, of course, there's an element of truth in that. But there's also um, an exaggeration. Uh, certainly from our perspective at Bedfordshire, we would never leave anybody to themselves. Um, there's quite a lot of support, and that's something we might talk about for universities generally. In the 21st century, there's been quite a lot of changes. Certainly in the past 10 years, mental health and well-being is on everybody's mind, and that's also something that we might want to pick up on. Any of these themes... Uh, be, would be very welcome if you want to put uh, your thoughts in your chat. Uh, Mark and colleagues will be do their best to respond. Well, let's think about the advantages and the disadvantages. There's always a price, and sometimes that price is money, the cost. It's money, and sometimes it's not money. But you end up paying for everything, whatever you do in life. And usually, whatever the endeavour, even if it's getting out of bed, it takes effort. If it's going downstairs, if it's choosing to buy this kind of pizza or that kind of pizza, there are choices, compromises, and it takes effort. The bigger the decision, of course, the more time and trouble you spend over considering. But it also takes time. Now, if you think about things in life in general, apart from education, whatever you do, it takes time because time is finite. We, as far as we know, we have one lifetime and there are so many hours in a day, so many days in a week. So whatever you do, it takes time. And if it's important, you put more effort in. And there's always a risk. One thing, <laughs> one thing that COVID has shown us is that the number one life is full of surprises, but number two, there's a risk attached to everything that you do. You know, going out into the garden, uh, there's a risk. You could be struck by lightning, but that's a very small risk. Um, but whatever you do in life, there is a risk. Failure is always um, um, uh, one possible outcome. The question is, what do you do when things don't go the way that you want them to? So there's the risk sometimes of embarrassment. There's the risk of making the wrong choice of buying the wrong kind of car or the wrong kind of trainers, whatever it is. If you think about your life as being a line, represented on the screen here by these two lines, one blue and one white. And in the blue line, I hope you can see that there is uh, that point there that represents your time spent in university. Now, in terms of the duration of your typical person's lifetime, it's about three years. But what are the consequences of that in terms of the trajectory, the direction, the options that are available to you? Well, one of the things that we notice is that with a university education behind you, you have alternatives, you have choices, you have opportunities that may not be available to someone who doesn't. So the two lines, you represent the, the white line, all things being equal, two people, similar background, but one goes to university, the other one doesn't. Typically, the one who goes to university has more options open to them more alternatives, more choices. And we like to think more wisdom. But let's not, <laughs> wisdom is another point that we need to come back to. Let's not run away with the idea that going to university guarantees any of these things. It just makes the chances of you achieving your ambitions, whatever they may be, a little bit stronger. And in terms of happiness, well, this is quite a big deal nowadays, and I would imagine it will become even more of a big deal in the future. Because mental health and well-being, this is not considering only people who are experiencing some kind of problem or crisis. But this is for the average person. We all have peaks and troughs in our levels of happiness, our levels of satisfaction, our levels with of um the sense of self and purpose. Now, these things fluctuate, and we know that. But the chances of you being happier for more of the time, they go up when you have the ability to control your circumstances.
And if we think about our circumstances at the moment, you look at the news and it, it it's quite depressing sometimes because we notice the climate is definitely changing. We notice that emissions and CO2 levels are problematic and they're having an impact on the climate. We know all of those things. We look at the news and we also hear about strikes. There's war going on our doorstep. So life is not happy for a lot of people. And these things are not going to go away. And there are th some things that we simply cannot influence. But if we forget about the global world stage and just think about the things that we can influence, change is a feature in our lives today. And that change is happening increasingly rapidly with the advent of increased digital technology. AI is creeping into just about every corner of human experience. Think about entertainment, think about education, think about banking, insurance, commerce. It's coming in everywhere. And coupled with um, uh, advances in technology on the street, CCTV is everywhere. Records are being kept. Now, does this have an impact on the future? Well, go back to that question that I posed at the uh, a few minutes ago about trying to anticipate what life is going to be like in the next 10 years or 20 years. These things are not going away. And if we think about the production line, increased automation is going to be something that we will become increasingly familiar with. And we'll come back to AI in a bit more detail. We also shouldn't forget the fact that people are moving around much more today than they were 10 years ago and 20 years ago. And that's because of different changes in circumstances around the world. The political environment is changing rapidly when we see what's happening in the Ukraine, for example. And this is having an impact on our everyday lives. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad and it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. It's just happening. If we think now about uh, digital technology, AIs, we know that it's affecting commerce and entertainment and communication and banking. But if you live in Milton Keynes or you've been to Milton Keynes, you will have seen that these little delivery robots are on the street and they're delivering supermarket goods. They're delivering pizzas and there is no delivery driver. And it's just happening through an app on your phone. And I would imagine that this is going to become more and more popular. We know that Elon Musk and the Tesla uh, aspects of, of cars and self-driving cars, this is still in its almost embryonic stage, but you can see that this is going ahead in leaps and bounds. We must also remember that one of the things that is uh, a challenge for AI, any algorithm, it's one of the strongest things about being a human being, and that's compassion. Being able to put yourself in another person's position and trying to imagine how they feel. We know because we are humans that we can relate to other people. Now, this is increasingly uh, problematic. We notice uh, when we have uh, an increased uh, aspect of social media, when it's used in a negative way, it can be really um, hurtful, painful. And so if we think about how things are working at the moment, is it going to get less? Is it going to stay the same or is it going to grow? Well, as I said, digital technology is touching every aspect of our lives even robotic dogs operating as security guards. And this is happening now. So the thing that we should think about digital technology, remember AI in itself is not inherently good and it's not inherently bad. It just is. Everything depends on the person or the people that write the algorithm. How much do they understand about humanity about compassion at the moment even self-learning algorithms so-called self-learning compassion is something that they simply cannot they cannot work out just yet and if we fast forward the rest of your working life now if you're a teenager 
And this may seem like it's beyond the horizon. It's it's very hard to imagine what it will be like when you're my age. It must be very hard to imagine what it's like to retire. For most people of your generation, it's probably going to be around 70, not in the 60s that you retire, or possibly future generations of politicians will push that retirement period forward again or back, push it back again. But think about the impact that this will have on your everyday life. What will it be like for travel, shopping, medicine, education? Whichever arena you look at, what you'll notice is that some jobs that we have come to accept will disappear. They'll be taken over increasingly by AI. Some jobs, though, it's not all doom and gloom. Some jobs will emerge, jobs that we can't imagine now, simply because as technology changes, opportunities change, and some jobs that we can't even anticipate will be something that you personally may find really fulfilling. You're really good at it, and it gives you that sense of satisfaction, that ambient level of happiness, if you like. And you're really lucky if you are successful in getting that kind of job. But that kind of job doesn't exist. So we don't know what qualifications or training or experience you'll need now. But fast forward 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you need to adapt. We will all need to adapt. And people like me are, I guess, lucky in that the idea of a job for life, although that's not a reality that many of us can relate to, we know people that did have that idea that once you start a job, you know, in your age 16, 18, that's the job you'll do until you retire. Well, that is consigned to history now for my children and their generation. The question is, if there's going to be changes in jobs, how do you adapt? One of the things we know then is that adapting takes effort, it takes time. And there are, if we think about the way that society is moving now, the purpose of education, it's not, as some suggest rather cynically, to create the next generation of consumers. Although when you look at what happens at sale time and Black Friday, the kind of panic now, that's a real trick that the economy has played on us, poor victims, the <laughs> members of the public, because we are told, we are encouraged to believe that we must hurry up and spend the money now. But there are consequences. If you keep buying stuff, what do you do with the old stuff? What you'll notice is that the idea of being rampant consumerism is starting to be a concern particularly amongst younger people. And that makes me very proud, very happy to see that. I think there are consequences, whichever choice you make, either as an individual or as a town or as a country, there are always consequences. So who you decide to do business with and in what way, there are consequences. And we hope that when you look around the classroom, your classmates, and try to imagine where they will be in the next 20 years. You're looking at the next generation of leaders. And that may seem like an amusing prospect today. But when you think about how people's lives unfold, particularly if you decide that education is something you're going to take seriously, then you will be in a position to make a difference. You will be in a position to influence outcomes. One of the things I noticed by watching TV recently that Miriam Margolis was on a program, a documentary, uh, traveling around Australia. And the question she was asking people as she traveled around was, do you think that you've had a fair go at life? And this is part of the Australian uh, psyche is that the Australian constitution says that equal opportunity for everybody, everybody should have a fair go. Now, that seems to me to be an admirable ambition for any government. 
Now, we call it equal opportunities, but I think like so many of these expressions, it's become a bit of a cliche. So the fair go makes us re-examine this concept of equal opportunities, regardless of your background, regardless of your gender, your orientation, your preferences, no matter what you look like or where you come from. Do you have a fair go in life? Are your opportunities equal? Well, to go back to the analogy of the two lines, I think that if you want a fair go, you really have to think about how you update your own mental software. So when the, the update comes for your phone and your computer, your laptop, your, most people don't hesitate. Yeah, I'll take the updates. But when it comes to updating the most important software that you will ever encounter, and that's the software inside your mind, learning, becoming wiser, becoming a better husband, wife, partner, a better version of yourself. You need to learn how you learn, because this is going to be a feature of your lives in much more than it has for previous generations, because change is happening so quickly. One of the uh, famous quotes that education changes everything I think if whatever your political agenda, whether you talk about having a fair go, as the Australians do, whether you talk about social mobility, you know, the class system, is it fair that I'm working class and you're middle class or they're upper class? Being able to move up the social ladder, well, education is the ladder. That's how you become successful. It's education. And that doesn't just mean university, of course. Basic literacy. Basic literacy is a game changer all around the world. But when you are in an environment where so many people are literate and you're in competition for jobs, then you need to be more than just literate. You need to know your subject. Now, teaching, if that's the kind of career that appeals to you, or maybe you haven't thought about it before now, but this is how you change people's lives, not just your own life really making a difference. And boy, does that make you happy. If you're looking for happiness, think about the good that you can do to other people. That All the research is very clear. It shows that this is how you increase your own self-esteem when you see yourself doing good things. So you help yourself by helping others. Education changes everything. It opens doors and to pursue the kind of career that satisfies you. So if you think about education for a better life for yourself, for those around you, and for the people that you meet. So I'm not going to read out what you can see on the screen. There are lots of different aspects to education. It doesn't necessarily mean working in a secondary school, but it could do. It doesn't necessarily mean working with children, but it could. And we have got a huge range of courses for teacher training, if that's what you want to do, or for studying education, if that's what you want to do. Or perhaps language is the thing that really gets you going. I mean, that's the career path that I took. I was a language teacher originally, going back some I started off about 30 odd years ago, 35 years. I started language teaching and I've traveled all around the world teaching English and training people to teach English. So the idea of education, it's not just rewarding to yourself because you see that you're helping other people. You are making an impact on other people's lives and just about everybody will have a story about an old teacher. It really does allow you to not just do something that you feel find fulfilling, but also you can see progression. There is a reward for all of the good work that you do, and that reward is recognition. If you're in universities, you start off as a, a lecturer, 
you can then rise to a senior lecturer and then a principal lecturer. So there is always a ladder, and that's in universities. In schools, it's no different, whether it's primary school or secondary school or whether it's the private sector. It doesn't have to be a state school, and it could be working with adults. One of the really rewarding feelings is if you're working, again, basic literacy, because it just changes people's lives. So this business about happiness, it's finding your mojo. Choose an occupation, and it doesn't really matter what the occupation is, if that's what you want. And if it's worthy, by worthy, I mean that you're making a difference to other people, helping. It's, it makes you feel so much better about the job, about yourself. And don't forget that if you're in business, every employer strives to have a happy workforce. And the reason is not just because it looks good in PR terms, but if you're happy in your work, you spend longer doing the jobs. You pay more attention. You have more energy. The quality of your work goes up because you're spending more time on it. So it goes up. It is what you might call a virtuous cycle. It's like the, the positive nuclear arms race, but quality goes up, happiness goes up, productivity goes up. Now, the opposite is true, of course, and that's one of the problems we see in all the strikes and the train drivers, the NHS, uh, post workers, university lecturers, <laughs> shouldn't forget them. Um, it's because it's the opposite, that you feel that your work is not being rewarded. But in a way, that's a temporary blip ever the optimist i think that's a temporary blip because that that in the career of your your working life you know that kind of strife is not normally protracted anyway find worthy occupations and that really does um, make a difference to you but remember everything that you decide to do will have a cost and that cost is usually it will take you time and boy oh boy it takes effort and energy. But if it's your goal, then these are prices that we're prepared to pay. Now, if you want to find out more about the kind of courses that we offer uh, at Bedford, on the Bedford campus in Bedfordshire, uh, there are a couple of links there. And by the way, if you would like a copy of these uh, slides as a PDF, we're very happy to distribute them. But back to the question of university then in the 21st century, what's the difference? between, let's say, going to university in the 1990s and going to university in the 20s. What's happened from the 20th to the 21st century? Well, there are some similarities, of course. Um, just about every course will cover theories, whatever subject you do. Um, some of those theories go back thousands of years. So we talk about philosophy, and I mentioned Heraclitus earlier, one of my great heroes, uh, the guy who said that your character is your fate. Um, I mean, he's made a lot of really good observations. Anyway, a good university, a 21st century university, will always talk about ideas that are enduring, that have been around for hundreds or thousands of years, because it's still it's true today as it was when it was first recognized or observed. But there will be that combination of theory and practice. How do you use these theories? Whatever the theory is, what does it do? How does it help? Because if it's a theory in isolation, that has a limited usefulness. But if that theory has a practical application and you can use that in your everyday work and you can see the difference that you're making, that's good on so many levels. So a university today will, of course, have old ideas. It will have theory. It will have practical application. There will be lectures, and sometimes those lectures are in lecture theatres, as you can see in the images here, and sometimes it's um, online. It could be like this, that we have video conference-type tutorials, one-to-one -one things online. One thing that COVID has taught us is that this is a really good medium, particularly if travel or distance is an issue. Tutorials, when you have two, three, four students and a lecturer sitting talking about something, uh, an assignment, a problem, an issue, uh, that's a common feature. 
but so too is something which is a little bit different, the interest in mental health and well-being. Now, that is not just for to support you as a student, although that is a really important part of the university experience. Having a personal tutor for the duration of your studies, your go-to person. And if you were doing um, English, that could easily be someone like me. And we'll we get to know one another very well. And this is the person that you talk to if you have an issue, a problem, or sometimes just drop in for a chat. We usually have what we call an open door policy, uh, where the door literally is open. And if we're in the office, stick your head in and say hi. And if we have time, we have a chat. And if we don't, we get the diaries out and find a time when we can. Now, uh, that kind of support, that well-being remember that's not just for people that have some kind of crisis although there are huge support mechanisms within the university just like many other universities the support for students is there whether it's for financial advice whether it's some technical problem council tax issues accommodation issues there are people who are specialists as well as trained counselors as well as your personal academic tutor but all of this contributes towards you getting the most out of your three years or four years, however long you take to, to complete your degree. And as you grow in your understanding of your subject, your confidence, your levels of skills grow up as well. And one of the nice little uh, experiences students tell me is when in the third year of their degree, they are told to go back and read some of the work that they produced in the first year. And <laughs> one of the common sentiments is, oh, who wrote this stuff? My goodness me. And that is the same person. And there's a, an element of humor about this. I mean, you can't escape the fact that it's quite funny that at one point in your life, you do the very best that you can and you submit it and you get the feedback. And then the next piece of work will be slightly different, but usually better. You get the feedback and it's kind of like a staircase. You kind of you escalate. But as you go up that metaphorical staircase, the quality of what you're talking about, the quality of your ideas, it goes up and you begin to realize that. And that is uh, against your well-being. That feels good. You get to know a few things. At Bedfordshire, if I may just say something that uh, is, I, I think, uh, a particular feature of our university and our school in particular, is that that combination of theory, whatever subject, there is always the dimension of practical application that shows you how you can use that theory. What difference does it make to anybody's life? And the personal dimension. Whether you're doing a degree in English or you're doing a, one of the teacher training courses, and we have many. Um, I, I've said various PGCEs. We have loads of, of PGCEs, and perhaps that's something you'd like to find out about. Feel free to ask. Whichever thing, whichever degree you choose, there will be uh, the opportunity for you to personalize your assignments. Particularly poignant would be the dissertation. I say poignant because it is quite an emotional experience a lawful an awful lot of effort goes into producing an 8000 word monograph but it's done with support and that's after 3 year towards the end of your 3 years you're in a position of strength to embark on that kind of project but the topic of the project is not set by me or by mark or by anybody else it's you you choose the thing that really interests you within your subject area the dimension of the topic, the subject, it's one that is meaningful to you. And this is one of the most important things about happiness is that if the goal is your goal and you see progress, that you're progressing towards making that goal a reality, that feels really good. Anyway, human superpowers. <laughs> um, the other thing that we notice happens during the course of your three years and by the way three years it may sound like an awful long time and at the beginning it probably is 
But after the first year, a common theme that students say is, I don't know where that year has gone. That would that just flew by. Another student may say that at the end of three years, I just blinked and it seems to have gone ever so quickly. I can't believe that three years have passed. So this perception of time, it's always relative. Um, and I don't expect you to trust just what I'm saying. But please, if you have friends who are in university, talk to them about things like time. How much time has passed and how quickly it passes. Uh, ironically, when it's things like deadlines, the time seems to fast for the time seems to fast forward before you know it, the deadline has approached. Um, but of course, when it's things you um really want to happen, it just seems to take forever. But that's that's just being human. Anyway, our superpowers. One of the things that gives us a huge advantage over any algorithm, any AI, is soft skills. This is something that uh, the algorithms simply haven't managed to uh, uh, master this, and it doesn't look like it's going to come anytime soon either. Being able to reflect on yourself, being able to critique yourself, being able to collaborate with kindness, being assertive, not bombastic, but when you're right and you know you're right um, and you hear people telling you something different, you decide whether you say, well, actually, I don't think that uh, you've quite got it right. There's another reason. There's another way of looking at this. That kind of assertiveness in a very positive way with diplomacy, with tact, with kindness. Now, that gives you a kind of confidence. It, again, this is not arrogance. Let's not confuse the two. But these are the things that really make a person an appealing or an attractive classmate, friend, lover, brother, mother. Actually, this is about human relationships. And when you think about soft skills, whenever you look at professional career openings, applications for graduate jobs, accountants, doctors, teachers, lecturers, soft skills, it's right up there. It's usually number one or number two after the qualifications. So you need subject specialism. Of course, if you do a degree in education, we expect you know about that aspect of education. A degree in accountancy, we expect you to know about accountancy, whatever dimension you've chosen to specialize in, but you need to know your onions. So that's taken as read. But also you need to know yourself. Where are your strengths? Where are your weaknesses? What are you good at? What are you not so good at? And what are you going to do about it? And do you feel that you have the capacity to do something? Because the way that you will fail with a guarantee is if you don't start. If you don't try, it's guaranteed 100% it's not going to work because you didn't even try. But if you try and you don't get what you want, try something else. And if you still don't get what you want, try something again in a different way. You keep going. And then sooner or later, you will get what you want. But to go back to this idea of uh, uh, looking for a professional position where you can make a difference and have a happier life for yourself, a more fulfilling, satisfying life, you need to know your subject. Whatever it, that subject is, you choose it, not anybody else. But you need to know yourself as well. And you need to have the confidence in yourself. We call this agency, and that's something I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But when you put these together, soft skills, it's a kind of a, um, a fluffy concept. And this is probably why AI simply cannot hack this. It's because it's very fuzzy, very fluffy. But it's all these things like creativity, empathy 
communication. Well, I need to say something about communication. This is supposed to be one of the areas I know about. If we think about communication, whether you're in a work setting, whether you're in a romantic setting, whether you're in a team setting, enjoying yourself, entertainment, communication. Everybody values communication, good communication, that people understand you and you present yourself in a way that is not too strong. And we all know how to communicate. We know how to talk, don't we? Well, it's all relevant. Relevant, relative, I meant. <laughs> Communication, there's a bit of irony. We'll edit that bit out. Um, it's all relative. So although I'm a professional speaker, this is what I do for a living, I talk. But put me in a court and I'm not comfortable because I'm not familiar with the conventions. And there are things that are not written down, but everybody who's part of the legal, the criminal justice system, they now have, they know how people communicate in a court setting. In a doctor's surgery, uh, one of the things that is really interesting is how medical specialists have to try to communicate what's wrong with a patient in simple everyday language. Now, they know the technical terms, but how do they make the little old lady or the little old man or the very young child, how do they make them understand what's wrong? So this is communication skills. This is really powerful stuff. But just think about chatting, text messaging. Are there rules surrounding text messaging? Well, gosh, yes, there are. Can you text too much or talk too much? And what happens if you talk too much? Talk too quickly, talk too slowly. If you don't say enough or if you talk at the same time as somebody else is talking, what happens? Or sometimes do you interrupt someone? You cut them off. So all of these things, I hope you're thinking, yeah, hell yeah, 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 yeah. That's because there is a, a lot of rules surrounding conversation, even informal chat. Uh, but those rules are not written down. But when it comes to job interviews, then you need to be a little bit smarter because no matter how good your background is, if you don't communicate what you bring, what you offer, then they may choose someone else who, who can put that across. So I guess one of the uh, questions then is, do you think talk is action? You know, sometimes you hear people say, are you going to do anything about it or are you just going to sit and talk? Well, that's suggesting that there's a contrast between talking and doing. Well, I just put that out there. Do you think talk is action? Well, one of the things we know is that talk has consequences. And those consequences if you're getting married, let's say the minute you say the words I do in the right context, there's a legal consequence. You're married. And if you are in front of someone like Judge Judy and you say things or she says things in a, at a certain juncture in the proceedings, that could change the direction of your life. And that's just because she said those words or when you're giving a statement, when you're giving a testimony, you're talking. But there are consequences, particularly if you don't tell the truth and you're found out. One of the things about uh, talk is that it definitely always has a consequence, an outcome. It requires energy. It requires knowledge and know-how. And it's through talk that we explore opportunities. Now, if this kind of thing interests you, our BA English covers all of these kind of things about communication, culture, uh, as well as literature, uh, crime. Um, it's all on the screen there. As I say, if you want a copy of this material, um, just let us know and we can send it out to you as a PDF. So this business of soft skills where communication is one of the biggest ones, it's that it gives you soft power. You're able to influence outcomes. You're, influ you're able to influence the way things are unfolding. And because change is just such a predominant feature, you're able to influence change. And if you're thinking about change, it's inevitable. I don't think it's something we should be afraid of. I think we should embrace it and regard it as an opportunity. 
as the uh, slight tongue-in-cheek um, little slide there suggests on the the picture on the slide change and chance it's almost the same word and if you think about it it's just perspective but if you think about change change is a feature of everyday life and so is failure and i don't think we should be afraid of failure because people who don't fail are people who don't try the minute you make an effort for something you know that there's a good chance that it's not going to work but what do you do when it goes wrong it's the idea of you know pick yourself up and dust yourself off and start all over again well that's the part of an old song but the idea of change is that it's coming anyway and you may as well have an impact try and steer the change the way that you want it to and the image of the train here is to remind me to say to you don't be like a railway carriage that's being pulled by another entity. It's much better to be the engine, the locomotive, where you decide how quickly or how slowly. So you're doing the pulling and the pushing. You're not being pulled or pushed. Be the locomotive. So remember, if you don't take uh, a risk, nothing's going to change for you. You always need to make an effort. It requires time, energy, and pay attention to what you're doing. And sooner or later, you will get the outcome that you want. And when you see that you're making progress, it makes you happy. So this business of happiness, mental health and well-being, this is a, a big deal in universities, <clears throat> excuse me, not just our university, schools, I know uh, this is a big deal in society generally. But the idea that you can wake up and be happy just as if by magic, that is perhaps a little bit unrealistic. The way to be happy is to make sure that you have a goal or a few goals, realistic ones, and notice when you start to make progress as you get a little bit closer towards achieving that goal. Being kind to other people makes you happy and being positive when you're criticizing other people, make that criticism positive criticism, not destructive, constructive. And don't forget to say thank you to people. And surprisingly, that makes people, it makes the person who says thank you feel happier. So just to sum up then, a 21st century university today has that combination of knowledge of your subject and skills to use that knowledge it gives you greater opportunities you make great connections networking is a huge deal as i mentioned earlier look around the room look around your classroom because those people that are studying with you now some of them will go on to do great things, and I hope you are one of them. You will be the leaders of tomorrow. So I'd like to finish off by saying that, just a quick reminder, these are the courses that we offer, and that's enough from me. I'm going to hand over to Mark. Over to you, Mark. And you're on mute, Mark. Classic. <laughs> Absolute classic. Thank you uh, so much, Theo. Um, Perry and I have been um, able to talk whilst you've been talking about um, so many of the ideas you, uh, you, you shared with us this evening. Um, this is an opportunity for Q&A. So as the uh, chat box has prompted, if you've got any questions for Theo, myself or Perry, please do drop them into the, uh, into the chat box and we will do our, our very best to answer them for you. There's some questions here that we've also posed for you. What are your what are your take home messages? Is there anything that Theo was discussing over the last 45 minutes which has surprised you? Is this wanted what you wanted to hear? I'm not sure if anyone entered the room this evening expecting to hear about philosophy or happiness or mental health and well-being. 
but ed ed education is a is a force for change uh, if you used to to uh, engage yourself in further and higher education uh it can not only change your lives but it can with the courses that, that theo shared with you this evening that we offer in the school of teacher education and the school of education in english studying those courses will help you to uh meet your mojo and will help you to help other people and, and, and play an important part in uh, many other people's lives. So we're here and we're waiting and uh, we'll, we'll take that awkward pause uh, to give you a chance to ask any questions if you have them. Well, while people are typing away, I and I hope that they are, please feel free to do that. A couple of comments in the chat. I see that Manos Fernando has given us the double thumbs up. Uh, I'm very glad that that was... Uh, um, received quite nicely for you. I see that Roshan is also saying that uh, he's an MBA graduate from <laughs> from Bedfordshire and he found this use this workshop very useful. I'm very glad to hear it. And if there's anything more we can do, Roshan, just get in touch. Thanks ever so much indeed, Theo. So if you do have any questions, feel free to chat, put those into the chat box. And of course, this is being broadcast also on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. So um, we will be monitoring the feed um, after tonight's session. So if any questions do arise um, after tonight's session, then we will make sure that they're also posted onto Theo, Perry and Mark, um, who will be in touch with you. David, is this a good point as well to promote some of the, the wider activities we're doing? We'll be doing a range of activities um, later on this term and next, uh, both in schools to support you uh, and help you become more informed and aware of the type of courses that we run here at the university, uh, but also here on the Bedford campus itself. So offering yeah. opportunities for you to come from, from school onto campus to experience life uh, in Bedford. Uh, th thank you, Mark. And I was actually going to to, to mention that um, if uh, anybody found tonight uh, interesting and informative, um, and they would like to um, uh, attend any future sessions, um, we do run a range of webinars throughout this term. Um, all details of which can be found on beds.ac.uk forward slash workshops. Um, you'll see our full webinar program on that website there. And you'll also be able to see all of the workshops that we have delivered as part of these webinars as well. The next webinar that we're delivering is on the 27th of January, and that is uh, looking at the criminal justice system and um, looking at uh, do prisons work? And our colleagues from Applied Social Sciences will be delivering that there. Um, you'll also see on there a range of other activities on uh, available to, to you um, from the University of Bedfordshire, both on campus, um, online, and through our school and college engagement teams um, covering Bedfordshire and surrounding counties. So that's beds.ac.uk forward slash workshops. So um, if uh, I don't think we're going to have any questions come through tonight, but as I say, this will remain on the university's Facebook and YouTube channels. Um, so if you do have any questions, do feel free to post on, on those forums after tonight's session. And we will make sure that those questions are passed on to Perry, Theo and Mark. Um, also, um, you, the, this workshop will be available to download from that website address there, beds.ac.uk forward slash workshops. And it will be available for you to, to watch back and reference um, as part of your current studies within your school and college. But all that remains for me to say is thank you ever so much indeed to Perry, Mark and um, Theo for tonight's really interesting webinar. And um, we look forward to delivering the next webinar on the 27th of January. Um, and that's on cr uh, the criminal justice system, as I say, in terms of do prisons work. So thank you ever so much indeed. Have a great evening and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Goodbye.